Let's just start with establishing why you know so much about the heart. Can you tell me just a little bit about yourself? <laughs> well, I'd like to think I'm an expert at the human heart because I get to do something that no one else gets to do. I get to touch the human heart every day. It takes forever to train as a heart surgeon. For me, if you add in all of my education on top of my training, it's about a 17 year process. What is your connection to the heart? Why, why did you choose to become a heart surgeon? There was one day when I was an intern that simply changed my life. So there I am minding my own business and a nurse grabs me and she says, my God, you have to come with me right now. You have to come to OR7 right now. She throws me into this OR that was just complete chaos. And in the middle of the OR table is a patient with their chest open and blood is shooting up like a fountain. And there's a surgeon who turns to me and says, I want you to reach in here and hold the heart, hold it steady so I can put some stitches in. Because I have these huge hands. I mean, I can palm a basketball with these hands and I can hold down about 13 keys on a piano, right? So I reach in there and they were the perfect size hands to just hold the heart, just so, just steady, so that he could put those stitches in. And that was it for me. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I'm holding the heart. This is incredible. And I'm saving a life. Wham, this is it. This is what I want to do the rest of my life. When you take a heart out of someone, does it carry any of the residual characteristics of the person that I was in? You know, I've done a lot of heart transplants, and those patients are the most incredibly brave patients that I've ever dealt with. Because imagine, imagine having your heart taken out and accepting the heart of another patient, another person, another complete stranger who's given you this gift of life for no reason. Patients often worry, you know, will I be the same after she opens my chest? Will I be whole again? Will I be human again? People go through that. There's a great story. I don't know if you remember Barney Clark. He was the first person to ever have an artificial heart put in. So they're talking to his wife and they're going through all of the discussion of all the risks, all the things that could potentially happen, the complications with the procedure. And when they finish talking to her, she only asked the team, the surgical team, one question. She said, if you do this surgery and you replace my husband's heart with a machine, will he be able to love me? That's what she asked. Of all the things that she could have asked about the complications of the surgery, she asked, will he love me? That is the power that people equate between love and the human heart. Do you think emotions like love actually affect the heart? I, I absolutely know that that happens. There is this amazing connection between the heart and the brain. And we see this in a syndrome called broken heart syndrome. Patients have almost exactly the identical features of a heart attack brought on by emotion. Breaking up with a loved one, the loss or death of a loved one, a shock or a surprise. And in broken heart syndrome, what we see is the upper part of the heart contracting a lot and the lower part not contracting or squeezing at all. When we examine them, we find that everything's normal. All their arteries are completely clean, no evidence of coronary artery disease, and it's simply this emotional shock that has stunned the heart. Do you think working on the heart has changed your heart? I mean, the way you look at life and the way you look at love and there was one um, time in particular, I was just impervious emotionally and physically, and my heart was hard. I had this shield, this full metal jacket, and I strapped that thing on every day and I went to work. I was on the pediatric service. I had to spend six months uh, dealing with children with congenital heart disease. So this one baby uh, that we operated on, I actually stayed at that baby's bedside for 11 straight days. and. You know, there was no way that this child was going to make it. It's a tough story. It's, uh, it's a hard story to talk about. When that baby died, the, um, the nurses did something incredible. They, they took the baby out of the incubator and let me hold the baby for the first time. In the whole 11 days I've been taking care of that baby, you know, I never touched that baby. I never connected. Well, why would I? I had my full metal jacket on. My job was just to keep that baby alive. It wasn't to touch that baby or be connected to that baby in any way. I had that hard heart, you know? And then I did something that, that, that nearly broke me in two. I took that child and I walked her down the hall to where her parents were. And I gave her 
you know, to her mom, who couldn't be there when she died, so that she could at least hold her and have that time of grief. And when you ask me if being a heart surgeon has changed me, that one moment I realized that I could take off that jacket, that I could connect with a patient, and that I wouldn't break in two. I keep telling people that time is so precious. We're given a certain number of heartbeats. You don't know how many you're gonna get. I don't know how many I'm gonna get. So I really think you gotta live every one of those to its fullest. Do you think the heart has any other function than being this organ that drives the body? When I'm at a bedside of a patient who's dying, and they take those last few beats of their heart and you watch a patient move between life and death, there is something very definite, very distinct that leaves their body when their heart stops. And they lose this essence of who they are. And I would like to believe, and I do believe, that the essence of what leaves them is their soul. And that's why I feel that the soul resides in the heart. Because once the heart stops, the soul is gone. And I have no scientific proof of that, but that's what I believe in my heart. Open cake, subscribe!